All right, folks, we're back again with Erica Brown. She is the publisher and editor of the Manchester Cricket, and she tells us all things Manchester by the Sea and Essex. How are you doing, Erica? Hey there. How are you guys? Great. Good. Good. Okay. So the... Yeah. yeah. The, the, we call it the skinny by the sea. <laughs> we got to get in touch with Liz Brown Swanson. You know, for Scoop Manchester, skinny by the sea might be a little close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I like it. <laughs> so what's the latest, Erica? Well, we've got a lot of things going on. We talked last week about the uh, businesses, um, you know, and, and the, the municipalities that are trying or local efforts to try to help local businesses now that, you know, people are adjusting to the new normal. And then they're also kind of adjusting to whether or not uh, their particular PPP applications or um, SBA applications, I mean, they're the emergency relief and PPP, whether they're being uh, efficient or not. Some people are getting them, some people aren't, and the people who aren't are very interested in what the municipalities are, are able to do for them, or, you know, whether or not the Chamber of Commerce can help out, things like that, looking for other areas for support. Um, in Manchester, that has started, the survey is, is going on, and um, it's really interesting. The downtown businesses are really, especially the retailers, that's what I'm talking about, the, sto the storefronts, they're really, um, they're really tuned in now to what are the issues that are impeding their ability to, you know, be a vibrant part of downtown. And I think that actually extends before COVID. Um, you know, there's some construction projects that were going to impact parking. That's now coming to the fore. Um, and also this whole issue of, and this is sort of a meta, meta issue about um, online and what makes a community downtown vibrant and what's the role of retail and with the prospect of it being taken away. Um, do you really take away that magic something that makes a community a great place to be? Um, so the local shops, can you imagine, um, you know, I would imagine real estate agents are really interested in when they market a town, they're marketing the experience of the community day to day of living there. And that is really the downtown profile. It's the downtown energy. It's, you know, do you really want to be in a town where you, <laughs> nothing against lawyers and doctors and professional services, but do you want to live in a downtown where the only thing downtown is like a drugstore and a bunch of offices? No. That's not what, you know, uh, we as a community have historically wanted. And now I think in light of sort of this recovery and coping with the new normal around COVID, um, it's really accelerated that conversation the way COVID has accelerated many, many things in life. It's kind of accelerated things that were already happening. Suddenly we're like, okay, it's right in front of us. It's right now. And it's really acute. It's acute. It's like right there. Did you even answer, ask me that question or did I answer like some crazy other question again? We just, we just wind you up and let you go, Erica. <laughs> I have a comment though. I do want to point out how unbelievably lucky the Manchester by the sea people are to have a grocery store. That's okay. I was actually thinking of that while I was yapping because mm -hmm. let me tell you, when you see these, um, you know, when you see what's going on with the state, and, and what's going on with the state right now is the state's testing more than, I think there's only one other state in the country that's testing more than Massachusetts. So we're a hot spot because we have a lot, a lot, a lot of cases. We have a lot of cases. It's arguable because we're testing. Um, so they're visible. But they're testing in hot spots, and there are these kind of hot spot issues where they go and test where there's a need for it. Big, urban, dense areas. And those places have issues with you know, shopping and thing and, and going to get your things done. And one of the things that a town like Manchester and our, our COVID rates are actually quite good. So is Essex. And a lot of it is because we have the luxury of being able to go down to get our groceries downtown. We don't really wait in lines. I don't think I've ever waited really in a line to get into um, Crosby's maybe once. And I think I waited for maybe 90 seconds. And you go in and, and Crosby's especially... I mean, I hate to call this out, but I'm, I'm going to, I don't care. Um, 
When I went to Whole Foods in Beverly a couple weeks ago with my husband, we had to go and get lamb for Greek Easter, right? And Crosby's was out of it. And so was Market Basket, actually, up in Gloucester. So we ended up going down to, it was a Sunday, we went down to um, uh, Whole Foods. We had to wait for probably 40 minutes in the line before we got there. It was a beautiful day. We didn't care. So it was fine. When we got in there, put on your masks, you're able to go in. That was the experience. No, at Crosby's, you go in. They have installed a running sink right next to the automatic door. You can wash your hands and then go in. They also have a Mondo size. It must be the 10,000 sheet version of like the sheets, the um, the, the um, sterilization sheets. You take one of those or you wash your hands or you do both. You put your mask in, everything's marked six feet aside and they've got the traffic lanes. You know, this is a one way lane, you know, for the cereal aisle. And then you kind of, there's a system and it's small, but it, it works. They always have everything. And guess what? Whole Foods didn't have all the stuff that Crosby's had in terms of safety and thoughtful precautions. You know, I'm not saying anything bad about Whole Foods, but it made me appreciate Crosby's, which is what you're, you're saying. A small downtown with a, a, a supermarket that's not a teeny little supermarket. I mean, it's it's big. It's not as big as Market Basket. Not as bad as, like you guys with the with Market Basket up in Gloucester, which is big and beautiful, but it's fantastic and it's been a real lifesaver for us here. So right, right, and it's a rare occurrence in America these days to have a family owned. It's still family owned, right, Crosby's? Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, the Browns. We talked about this before. Browns. It used to be Browns Market for almost a hundred years. And my husband was actually involved with this and they, the family wanted it to be sold to a family. Mm. And so they sold it. And my husband, this, this is the truth actually. It's the early nineties. My husband met with Jim Crosby himself for coffee in the mornings quietly every month for, I want to say it was like maybe six months in my memory. Like I, for six months, they just talked a little bit each, each month about, how it would work, the transition and the sale and all that stuff. It was a conversation and it wasn't just with my husband. I don't want to act like that, but but he was kind of the the, the guy who kind of started the conversation and, and kept it. And it was with Jim Crosby himself. And it was very personal. So, oh. well, so Eric, you, you also wanted to follow up on uh, Konomo Point. Oh yeah, Konomo Point this week. Um, they had another um, conference called Joint Meeting. Uh, with the BOH and the BOS. Remember last time there was like <laughs> the F <laughs> got out. Um, much different, much more, you know, although somebody didn't mute and you could hear them yelp when they 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 made their decision, which was great. And they went, ah, you know, and they still were supposed to mute. But um yeah, they made a decision this week to kind of partially retrieve what they wanted so uh if you remember last time the seasonal deed holders and the seasonal tenants basically um were told that the april 15th time that they were going to be coming back was delayed till at least may 4th because of the state of emergency and they had been spooked because a bunch of people the weekend before had come back what i didn't realize was that the residents um there's a hundred residents roughly in the winter and it goes up to officially 400 residents in the summer so that really was they were bracing themselves for a 4x plus all of their friends um kind of explosion and so they basically said that seasonal tenants can come back um which was really greeted nicely as i just mentioned um, but it's still closed off to non-residents in terms of just being able to go and visit. So you have to actually be a guest of one of the actual residents there. You have to be a Gloucester shell fishing uh, license holder, or you have to be a contractor with a valid um, work permit. Those are the only people. And we ran that this week. We have a picture of, you know, a contractor driving through the gate that says nobody is allowed. So that's in this week as well. Um, and I think that was really welcome. And it, the timing was perfect because the meeting was on Monday. And then on Tuesday was when Governor Baker extended the um, state, you know, the, the mandate, the emergency kind of mandate to the 18th. So um, I'll tell you, if they hadn't had that meeting the night before and it was just sort of intuited that it would be extended and these seasonal people who were trying to get back to their homes or what they think are their homes, um, the, their summer homes, of course, 
um, if they had heard that it was extended, I, I don't think it would have been very, um, I think it would have been, they, they would have gotten a lot of calls at town hall, put yeah. it that way. There's a lot of tension around people wanting to start their summers, as we know in Gloucester with the ramps just being reopened. So um, There's also this discussion, it's interesting, there's this uh, interesting discussion between, and I see it in Manchester, I see it in Essex especially, which is, don't tell me what to do, I'll do the right thing. Um, you know, the, the association, the, the homeowners association out in Kenoma Point said that before, I don't know if you remember, they said, they said, listen, give us the chance to self-regulate. We'll do the right thing. And it was the president, Bob Sisk, his name is, it's the president of the um, Homeowners Association out there. And, and he was basically pleading to them because the Konomo Point thing is kind of a, a it's a bruise. It's, it's a tender thing because of the whole lease history. And he was saying, listen, we have a bad history. Give us the opportunity to mend this, begin to mend this, this, this you know, and of course he didn't get what he wanted. It was very interesting on Monday. Bob Sex spoke and he said, we want, I want you to know that despite the fact that you are now lifting this restriction, I am going to remake my promise of three weeks ago and I'm going, we are going to recommend to every seasonal holder that they stay away on their own until after the, uh, the governor's thing. It was an interesting point because you have this kind of, let us just do the right thing on our own, you know? as opposed to being mandated by some, you know, what they would say is a nanny state type of thing. Manchester's going through the same thing right now with Singing Beach this morning on the Board of Health. They were talking about how are they going to have this sort of staged return of opening up, in particular, Singing Beach. Um, the parks are now going to be kind of opened up. Um, the Harbor Master has never shut down the, the ramp in Manchester, although I believe it was shut down in Gloucester and they just opened it up on Monday, right? Yes. Yeah. So that that wasn't done. And, and compliance was fine in Manchester. There was no problem with the boats. No, none. No problem at all. Everyone was fine. And they're hoping for the same kind of thing. They're saying, well, why don't you just open up Singing Beach? We're going to do the best thing. I mean, on, at low tide, it's such a wide thing. We can social distance and it's a, a wonderful place to be able to go. Um, the town officials, of course, are worried about the train. They're worried about like, you know, everyone texting their friends in Boston and saying, hey, Singing Beach is open and everyone comes down. So that's what they're worried about. But no decisions there yet, right? No, they're going to they're going to uh, approach this over the next several weeks. I, I think the next thing that's uh, Greg Federspiel was saying was that uh, they're going to make some recommendation to the Board of Selectmen to act on. But really, I think it's it's um, Greg is working with Todd Fitzgerald, the police chief, to make a plan that will be um, kind of uh, realistic and sensitive, but also take into account the fact that, and it is a fact, that we don't have massive problems with people, you know? Um, people are being really good. They're being really good and they're being good on their own. They're not being good because somebody's chasing after them, telling them, you know, hey, you know, nobody's doing that. Yeah. Right. Great stuff as always, Erica. Yeah. So. Right. Thank you very much. We'll uh, see you next week. What? We'll see you next week. Absolutely. I can't wait. You're like the highlight of my week. Oh, my God. <laughs> I know. It's pathetic. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> All righty. Bye, guys. All right. Be well. See you soon. All righty. Bye.